Hello everyone. Right now I am with Jeff Coleman, who is a consultant based out of Toronto. Yep. Today he is going to be advocating and talking about a very important topic, which is called a state channel. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the ways by which blockchain technology could scale to the billions of people it needs to scale to. Before we get into that theme, let us have an introduction from Jeff. Uh, so my name is Jeff Coleman. Uh, I work with a company called Ledger Labs in Toronto, Canada. Um, I've been very active in the blockchain space for a while, since 2010. Um, I do a lot of uh, writing, a lot of consulting, a lot of speaking, and some research, um, some of which I presented here at the conference. And I'm very passionate about the idea of state channels. I think it's something that everyone should understand um, and be aware of. And even though we're a little bit familiar with some of the ideas in it already, I want people to understand that it's a really very simple concept and it can make things a lot better. Okay, so so in a sense, the 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 problem with the current blockchains is uh, when you want to build an application on Ethereum, you're faced with two things. Uh, one is the latency of the blockchain. Yeah, waiting for the blocks for sure. So, for instance, if you think uh, you need like three confirmations, so the uh, latency depends on how much security you want out of a transaction. But you want say if you want three confirmations, then it's a minute. Mm -hmm. That's a lot for one operation. And then the scalability or the cost of an operation. So right now it might be below below an ether, let's say one tenth of an ether, but it might easily explode into a big number if Ethereum becomes popular. For sure. And it's it's not only about with confirmations, it's it's not so much about uh, finality and conclusion and security um, being only possible on the blockchain. It's just that when we do do things on the blockchain, then we have to wait for confirmations. And of course, it's great with Ethereum that those confirmations come about every 15 seconds instead of waiting like 10 minutes or something like we're used to with Bitcoin. Um, but there, there is a way of thinking about it that will help you restructure your, your applications so that even then you don't have users clicking a button and then waiting for... 15, 30 seconds while well, something figures something out in the background. Okay, so what is a state channel? State channels are very simple. Um, they're an idea that we're already familiar with uh, in the form of payment channels. Payment channels are an example of state channels. Uh, but it, it, it's important, I think, to think about them in the general case uh, because a lot of what we've seen about payment channels are sometimes called micropayment channels. Uh, in the Bitcoin world, it's a little bit, it sounds complicated and it sounds messy. And that's just because of the way that those have to be implemented in the, the Bitcoin scripting language. And uh, when we start thinking about them in terms of state channels, we see that it's, it's actually very simple. So I'll, I'll just jump in and explain the three parts that make a state channel, because there's just three parts. The first part is you have some state. You have something that could be tracked on the blockchain. It, it doesn't have to be money. It could be any information. Um, and this information, this state that's tracked in the blockchain, is going to be dealt with or interacted with by a defined group of people. So there's some flexibility that could be more than one person, it could be two people, um, but there's going to be a defined group. And that defined group is going to get together and agree to take that state and lock it up, and lock it up into a smart contract. So that's step one. You take the state, you lock it up into a smart contract. Now this smart contract, um, it has two parts to it. One part is if everybody who's involved agrees, then the state can be reconfigured. So for example, in Bitcoin, this is done with multi-signatures. So multi-signatures are a way for different people to sign off and say, yeah, we all agree that this is the way that things should actually be. But then the important part of what makes it a state channel is you have another part, uh, which I like to call the judge. And the judge is uh, something that can say, you know what, even if everybody doesn't agree, or if we have some conflicting points of view, these are the rules for how I'm going to settle this. And what that means is that in part two of the state channel, so you've locked up the state, now that you have the parties who have agreed to the state and you have some, something that's inside of it, some money, some property, some agreement, now you can send messages just directly between each other promising what you're going to do with the agreement. And you know that the judge on the blockchain will treat those messages as the rules. And it will take those messages and it will enforce them. So that if you make a promise to another person, even though you haven't put it in the blockchain yet, if you disappear or if you go away, they can take that promise and go to the judge and say, this person promised me that I could have this amount of money. Or this person promised me that, that this state would be changed in this way. 
And the judge will take that promise and then not just listen to the one person, it'll say, kind of wait and, and turn to the other person and say, do you have anything to say? Did, did, is there another promise here that, that changed this agreement later? And if it did, then we'll, we'll change that. And because you know that the judge is always going to decide um, exactly what you've agreed on, it means that those messages are actually final. So even though you haven't sent them into the blockchain yet, because everybody knows what the judge will decide, just as soon as you have the promise, you can count on it as being done. So that's part two. Part one, it's locked up on, on the blockchain with the judge. Part two, you're sending messages between people there. You can think of them as promises or agreements, and you're signing off on them. And you can't, you can't update the, the state without the agreement of everyone who's affected. Everybody has to, has to sign off on these agreements and agree to them. So it's, it's still trustless. It's not, you're, not, you're, not, you're not trusting the other party. You're just interacting with them. You still have the full guarantees of the blockchain. And then part three is when you're done with everything and you want to close it out. And this might never happen. You might keep this open forever. But if, if you're done with it and you want to close it out, then as long as you all agree, um, you don't even have to use the judge. You just, as long as everybody signs off and says, we're, we're done with this arrangement, we agree that this is the final consideration of the state, this is how everything should be, you just submit a transaction and instantly the state updates and, and you go about your way. But if there isn't complete agreement, if, if one person um, has disappeared and, and the other person is, is trying to figure out what to do, or if one person says, this is the case, and no, this is the case, and they can't agree, then they'll just submit the promises that they have to the judge, and the judge will take the latest promise that, that trumped all the other promises and say, okay, this is the one. And I can tell because everybody has signed it. So you're guaranteed that the state is going to be closed out in a way that corresponds with what everybody's agreed with. So let's take an example. And the example I want to take is uh, a company running on the Ethereum blockchain. Okay. Let's, say, uh, let's say there are five of us and we start a company. So it's sure. Meher, it's Jeff, Alice, Bob, and Carol. The five of us start a company, okay. and we create a smart contract that represents our company, sure. and we issue shares. And the okay. five of us are, 20, are owners in the company. So it's 20%, 20%, Alice 20%, every one of us gets 20%. And then all of us put you know, 1,000 Ether on it, so it's 5,000 Ethers in the contract. So yeah. the contract has tokens. The five of us own those tokens, and it has 5,000 Ether in them and it's all locked in a smart contract. Yeah, and, and the way that people would normally think about this is you have a, kind of like a list, kind of like a ledger in the blockchain and you're gonna record who has this and anytime you make any changes, you're gonna submit a new message to the blockchain. Yeah, so it's the normal way to think about it is now, let's say Meher wants to sell 10% uh, of the company to the next person, which is, I don't know, Tim. So the normal way to think about it is uh, Meher will now send sell it to Tim and then send this message to the blockchain. The blockchain will confirm, it will take a minute, yeah. it will eat up gas, but the transfer would be done. Yeah. And what you're saying is, instead of Meher sending the message to the blockchain, what these five people agree to do is to lock up the current state in the blockchain mm -hmm. and then do all the transactions they want that want to change this current state outside the blockchain. So send messages yes. outside the blockchain. Yeah. So for example, in this case, when I'm transacting outside the blockchain, if I want to sell the shares to Tim, I basically sign a transaction that says, you know, transfer the claim over these shares in that locked up state on the blockchain to Tim. And Tim has that receipt uh, for himself, right? Right. So. In this case, um, there's kind of two different ways that you could be doing something here. So either, um, remember that the state in a state channel is with a defined group of people. So either Tim is part of that defined group, in which case um, he's going to be one of the people pass passing the messages back and forth. And then all you need to do is you're basically sending that promise to Tim. And Tim knows that if he went to the judge, he could cash in on that promise. But maybe he knows that there's going to be more changes in the future. So he doesn't want to go back to the judge all the time. So he just holds on to it for now. And then maybe he'll be trading it back and forth. Or maybe the, maybe there's there even a market for the, these shares and you're going really fast back and forth, making lots of changes. So that's one way. The other way is it could be the, the group agreeing that the company is going to give shares to Tim and Tim isn't part of the group. So in that case, as long as, as everyone in the group who could potentially be affected by this is signing off on this, this new share issuance, whether they're creating some new shares or maybe they're selling some of their existing shares, um, 
and maybe they're going to do this frequently and they're going to make a lot of changes. As long as they've set up that judge correctly, they can do this in a way that most of those interactions don't require them to send a message into the blockchain. So that could be for the, the tokens, it could be for the, the ether that the company controls and the thing that it wants to do. And, and this is where the concept gets really powerful because even though those people just have a, an agreement amongst themselves, if these agreements are connected together, this is the idea in Bitcoin of the lightning network or hub and spoke payment channels, but it applies to state channels as well. If you have these connections that are all adding up together, you can make it so that maybe that group doesn't have an agreement with Tim, but they have an agreement with a hub and the hub has an agreement with Tim. Then if, if they send a promise to the hub and the hub is part of their, their group, and then the hub has a different agreement with Tim and the hub forwards on the promise to Tim and the promise to Tim is dependent on the promise from this group to the hub. This can be done trustlessly so that even the spending of the ether to maybe a completely different company that, that Tim is involved with or that somebody else is involved with that they've never interacted with before, that can all happen with just this special passing off the blockchain. Okay. And the big advantage here is that since you're not, the transaction is not in the blockchain, the latency falls to basically the speed of light. <laughs> exactly. It's literally, you're just sending a message. So you, you have to sign the message. You have to, so that the judge can later verify that it, it was actually authorized by you. And then you have to send to the other person. They have to check the contents and make sure that it's a valid message that they're convinced that the judge will accept it and process it correctly. And then if the state affects them, they have to sign off and agree. Yes, I agree to let this affect me and then send back the confirmation and you're done. So it's, it's almost as simple as just sending a message to a web page and back. And you don't have to sit around waiting 15 seconds for blocks and also we know that storage and transactions and computation on the blockchain is expensive because everyone on the network has to do that well in this case if the judge is being appealed to everyone on the network has to do that but in most cases because the participants already know what the judge is going to say and there's some additional cost to using the judge they'll prefer to just all agree unanimously and all sign off and say yeah i agree that that's the case even if one of them is maybe in the wrong like if one of them maybe tried to defraud the other and the other person comes back and say hey i have proof that you tried to defraud me and if i take this to the judge he will punish you and the person will say no no no, no. i'll pay it back in full right now because I know that if I go to the judge, I have to pay it back anyways and get some additional punishment. So for example, if you have some deposits that the judge has the power to destroy or confiscate. So in essence, the, the reason this is possible is, uh, is because of, I think, Nick Savo's concept of wet code versus dry code. It's like the normal, the normal system of ju uh, jurisprudence that we have is wet code. It is reliant on human subjectivity of the judge. But in this case, when you go into a smart contract based system like Ethereum, the whole code is dry and it's completely deterministic. Given a particular set of inputs, the output of, of a computation is completely determined. Exactly. So if, if there's something on the blockchain, you can exactly predict and the blockchain is a judge, you can exactly predict what the judge is going to do. Exactly. And now because I, let's say the five of us are in this company and I know that I am exchanging messages with each other. Even if I want to defraud you, I know in the back of my mind that there's the judge and he's dry code and I know that he's going to de decide in your favor and uh, it's going to cost me money to run this thing on the blockchain. So basically I, I end up not defrauding you. Right. So it's kind of like you can extend the metaphor into kind of a social metaphor and think that if every criminal always knew that the police would catch them, there'd probably be a lot less criminals because they, the police would actually have a lot less work because they're so powerful and competent. And it's kind of the same situation with state channels where you have to write a judge to whatever, whatever you're going to do. The judge has to have all the rules that say exactly what happens in what case. Um, the judge has to be able to verify and prove just in a program that everything happened. But as long as the judge has that code for how to handle all the situations, you'll probably never have to use it because people already know in advance what the judge is going to say and they're just going to agree to it anyways rather than have the additional cost of involving the judge. Hmm. That's, 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 that's a really powerful idea. Isn't it's it? extremely powerful, extremely helpful. And um, almost every application that I see built on Ethereum could be modified to work this way. So a lot of times when you see something like maybe you see someone with a, a smart lock and they've got uh, something where they're, they're going to 
send a message into the blockchain to authorize someone to use the lock. Well, that's not necessarily something that you need to put on the blockchain. If you're going to have millions of these locks all over the place, that's a lot of noise and messages going in there. What you really want is you want it so that there's a lock of who's able to control the, the, the smart lock or whatever it is that you're trying to control on the blockchain. And then you just send a promise to this person and they can send that promise to the lock and the lock goes to itself, okay, so if this was submitted to the blockchain, the blockchain, then the judge would agree. So I can actually just listen to this now. I don't have to wait for a block confirmation. And that, that just means practically speaking that, um, um, and, and, and to a certain extent, people already, already do this where every time you lock or unlock the door, you're not going to send a message to the blockchain. Every time you invite a new friend to give, have the permission to lock and unlock the door, you don't have to send a message to the blockchain. But you still have the security of the blockchain. Because in the end, if, if there's not a very clear digitally signed approval that, that the lock knows that the judge would respect, then it's not going to do anything. And if there is any confusion where maybe somebody um, says, you know what, I did, I did give you this update, but then I later revoked your access. So maybe I gave you a promise and said um, that you could rent my home, but then I found out something about your credit history and that you defrauded people in the past and I immediately revoked that access. Well, because of the way the channels work, every time there's an update, everyone is aware of the update. So the lock would be immediately notified. You don't even have to wait for a block to shut out this, this person that you previously agreed to. And it, it will instantly know and be instantly aware. Cool. Uh, so, so, what are the barriers to moving to this kind of architecture? Why don't we hear of it more often? So, it's just slightly more complicated than the way people are used to building applications. So, um, Normally, the way people think about a blockchain application, and this is, this is totally reasonable and totally makes sense, is they're thinking, um, what do I have to store? Um, what code do I have to, to enforce the rules on what's being stored? And then how do I build a, a user interface that interacts with this? Um, and you need almost all the same things to do the same application based on a state channel. It's just that instead of that code being the normal way that you interact, all that same code is going to be there, but it's going to be inside of this judge wrapper. And the judge is going to have the ability to enforce all of those rules and check all of those things. And you're going to have to structure it. Sometimes you have to additionally take into account which people are interacting with which people. Because the normal way that this blockchain application is designed is the blockchain is at the middle and everyone is interacting with the blockchain. Well, um, if you're going to go into a state channel, you probably don't want everyone to interact with everyone else. That would be a little bit crazy. You want to make it, figure out who does, who does everyone actually have to interact with. And you might, if you're the one who's running the contract, you might end up running your own server that's kind of a hub that everyone else interacts with. And then the hub and the interactions with that can be decided by the judge so that people are still confident that the interactions are trustless. You're not um, being given the power to change things if, if you have some kind of... Um, disagreement um, or some kind of internal fraud or maybe you've mismanaged your institution, people's funds are not going to go up in smoke. This is not going to be a Mt. Gox type situation. Um, but you, just by being available and being in that role, you facilitate things between them. So you, you have this additional wrapper around the idea and then of course um, you now become responsible for passing the messages yourself because in the traditional architecture everyone just watches the blockchain if something changes the application changes you now have to figure out additionally how to send these messages back and forth so it's a little more complicated but it's not little, too bad it's a little more complicated because um, what essentially starts to happen is you need to interact with the blockchain in order to lock the state and unlock it later right just the very beginning when you set it up and at the end when you close yeah. it up but for the for the for the client software on like let's say only five people they do need to interact with the blockchain twice and then there needs to be maybe a central server that coordinates uh, all of all of the five people so it becomes this kind of hybrid model that's like a decentralized network and maybe a centralized server on top and then people communicating with uh, the updates to that centralized server so it's it's kind of maybe a more complex architecture that we will get to in the next couple of years. Absolutely, this this will have to be built out, and we really are going to want all these different things to be connected to each other. So, for example, in, in terms of even just the payments use case, um, you don't want to have to be setting up and unsetting up this interaction every time you start to use a new website or start to use a new service. You really want to be already set up with maybe just a couple of of really 
uh, well available, um, well connected, reliable hubs that you know are not going to go down when you're trying to make a payment. Because remember, when they go down, they can't take your money, but it might delay you because you might have to go and say to the judge, hey, you know, I have this promise and this person's not here and I need to get this money. Um, and you can always do that. You always have the recourse, but doing that um, is going to slow things down. So you want to be connected to just a few reliable things and then maybe they're going to be connected to a lot of other reliable things and those are going to be connected to the users. And you want to have this, this whole topology set up so that if I'm interacting with someone, I don't have to already have an existing business relationship with them. We're going to have somehow be able to connect through our network and then through that network be able to instantly transact. So, uh, when I've been looking at some of the ideas at the Ethereum DevCon, I realized that because we are so early in the development of smart contracts, that the kind of contracts people are making today could be in theory completely trustless, but the developer still wants to retain control over how the contract behaves because there might be a bug in it. Mm. So, the developer wants the discretion of uh, having the power to update the contract just to avoid the bugs. Now, if in a state network, you are also assuming that once you have locked the contract, you can't change uh, what's happening, the, co the smart contract itself. So maybe the um, maybe like the the ways by which we script smart contracts or our confidence in smart contracts has to increase to the point where we can say that, look, we are never going to touch the actual smart contract on the blockchain. So let's do everything on chain. So well, this is the really important part about Ethereum. So. When people are, are used to talking about payment channels in the context of Bitcoin, uh, remember this judge that I'm talking about. In Bitcoin, you don't really have the ability to write a judge and put them on the blockchain. So you're trying to simulate a judge with all these additional timing things and things like this. In Ethereum, you have an actual judge and you can update that judge's behavior. So you can change the smart contract while it's in operation. You just have to define ahead of time what the rules are. So like a really simple thing that a lot of people can do if they're writing a, a smart contract and they want to have the ability to change it, make sure that they put in place the rules for the change. So it's not that they have authority to just jump in and change everything around while somebody's using it. Maybe they have to notify people and then there's a certain time delay before the change comes into effect. That way people know that a change is coming and they can look over it and see if it looks legitimate or if it's just taking everybody's money. So put some kind of additional barrier in there. The other side of things, of course, is that when you're doing these off-chain transactions, you're doing a lot of verification yourself. So that code has to be very reliable and, and very secure. So definitely we're not going to see this built out overnight. It's going to take time to make sure that we figured out all the edge cases and produce standards and find the best possible ways of doing this. But once we have, because of the complexity that's possible in Ethereum, then what we're going to find is that you can make very complex changes even just inside of the promises that you send to each other. Maybe there's a new kind of condition you want to enforce. As long as the judge can understand a general enough kind of promise, you could just write that condition into the promise that you made even though you didn't know what the condition was going to be when you set up the channel. Cool. So what do you think is the first, like any big idea needs to start with, with a small application where, you know, some, a small team of developers can build something useful, demonstrate its utility. Do you have in mind something small where you could, where you foresee this being applied first and then scaling out well, those applications? To be clear, this is already being applied. So uh, a lot of, of the larger, more complex applications that people are designing, they absolutely have to take advantage of this approach. So for example, Augur is definitely taking advantage of this approach. Um, that's definitely a key part of how they're structuring their application. Um, people are definitely working on implementing this for, for payments in the payment scenario where you're going to have this hub and spoke network where you can rapidly send between people. A lot of people are talking about this anytime they try and do micro payments or um, they want to update something really rapidly. So a lot of people are using this, this idea today. What I think people need to start wrapping their heads around is that this really is the default way of doing things. This is the way that everything should normally work. You know, the, the blockchain is absolutely amazing and powerful, but it's also very expensive. Everything that's done has to be processed by all these different people. And as long as you know that that's reliable, you don't have to put everything through there. You don't have to dump all of your, your details on the blockchain. And in, in fact, not everything belongs on the blockchain. You know, it, it's not, it's not a, a, a big bin that you just want to throw everything into. What you need to do is just put the simplest, most important part on the blockchain. And then build your application in a way so that it relies through that. And you know, a lot of people talk about, oh, 
the gas limits are really low right now in Ethereum. It's hard to write complex contracts. Chances are, if you're running into the gas limits, you probably haven't structured your application or you appropriately. You thought the architecture through. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah, cool. So, uh, are there any great articles or blogs that our listeners could go and read in order to discover more about state channels? Right now, there's not a lot of content out there. There are a couple of articles that people have written about um, mostly talking about how you can take the idea of payment channels and make it a smart payment channel in Ethereum, which I think is kind of the backwards way of thinking about it. State channels is just a very general technique and payment channels are just an instance of that technique. And even in, in, in Bitcoin, I think people are aware of that to a certain extent. Um, but right now, there, there isn't a lot of, of good detail out there. There is, I know someone maintains a list on GitHub of um, all the new papers and information that have been written about payment channels specifically. And I've seen a, a, a couple of, of great blog posts. Unfortunately, I don't remember uh, who they're by at the moment, but you can find them if you Google for them, talking about smart payment channels and the, and the idea of using smart contracts in channels. Um, but probably over the next couple of months, we're going to start to see people write up really more detailed explanations and help people understand that this is a really basic critical tool in how you use blockchain. So uh, for, our, for our viewers that would like to follow the idea of state channels and follow you in your evangelization of this idea, where can they reach you? Uh, well, I, I have a, a short blog that I occasionally throw things up at, at jeffcoleman.ca. Um, obviously, the company, my company that I'm connected with, Ledger Labs, um, has a website as well. Um, right now, it's fairly minimal, but uh, we might throw some stuff up in there later. If anything interesting is happening, put some links on there. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, this is mostly going to be about, you know, do a Google, Google search every once in a while and just see who's come up with something. Um, the cool thing about a distributed ecosystem like the world of blockchain is that people have new ideas out of nowhere. It's not someone you were even already following. It's just all of a sudden somebody pops up and they've got this great way of describing something and explaining something and they just really change the way that everybody's thinking about it. And I think that's amazing. It's absolutely fantastic. It was great to talk to you, Jeff. Absolutely. Thanks for talking. Thank you.